A few days ago, this beautiful woman, she's middle-aged, probably in her mid-60s, I don't want to mention a name, of course, she walked into my office. Uh, she had cancer. Over the last couple of months, she had made a lot of dietary changes, changes in her lifestyle, fantastic changes in terms of her nutrition, in terms of her activity, her physical health, and all of these things. She had started putting it together. She went for a PET scan. The cancer had spread from the breast to the liver to the lungs, hit the bones. I couldn't figure out why when a woman was making so many changes, she went through conventional treatment, she was doing everything right and looking after the side effects of the medication at the same point. Yet the cancer kept on spreading and spreading. When this happens, the first question that comes into my mind is why is the body creating an environment which is allowing the cells to be favorable? Why is the terrain of the human body allowing the growth and the spread of the cancer? There's one thing about you know stopping the spread, keeping it in one place, and then using immunity and conventional treatment to break it down and put it into remission. <clears throat> So I kept talking to her for, for a long time, trying to get to the root cause of what could be the issue. We went into her emotions, we went into everything, and then finally she asked her family to leave the room and it was just her and me alone. And she broke down and she cried and she cried and she cried. And finally when she stopped crying, she told me at the age of five, she got abused, sexually abused by a medical professional. And since then she's lived every single year of her life with fear, humiliation, that constant, constant anger and unforgiveness in her. As she grew up and she had children, she was very protective of her own children. She wouldn't allow them to go anywhere alone. So her joint family, her husband, her own children started, you know, being bitter towards her, saying like, you know, why are you being this way and why are you being so, you know, insecure about us? And yet at that stage, she couldn't muster up the courage to tell them that why that's why she's so protective because she got sexually abused by someone you would never dream would sexually abuse someone at an age of five and then she went on and I kept asking her what made you not say these things so she's saying at a younger age it was humiliation and it was rejection she felt that if people came to know no one would marry her because her body was sexually abused <clears throat> when she got married and she was in a loving relationship with her husband she still didn't want to tell people because she felt that you know people would feel sorry for her people would you know you know look down upon her some people would just tell her oh forget about it it's okay it's happened now think about your life so she had her own fears her own illusions which are real to her but built up over the years and she was constantly sick during these years she had constipation she had low immunity <clears throat> and finally a cancer am i trying to say that this is the root cause of a cancer i'm trying to say that Emotional suppression is the root cause of every disease in this, on this planet. And you can go on looking for literature and science to back this up. And we constantly say that these things are not proven. Because I'll tell you one thing for sure. There is no money for anyone in proving that emotions can be the root cause of diseases. Because then there's no medical drug that can be sold for that solution or a conventional medicine. People, we got to wake up and be real. We know that oxygen is inexpensive and literally free and we know it's one of the best medicines on this planet but it can never be patented and it can never be sold as a drug and that's why there is no science and continuous research telling people that if they only breathe the right way, they take in the right amount of oxygen, half their problems including high blood pressure creating an acidic to alkaline body can happen only in the way you breathe, the digestion of your food, the assimilation of your food. But there's never going to be research on this and that's why people wake up and say, oh, this is all crap. Emotions have nothing to do with it. Everyone has stress. Be strong. Deal with it. But the truth is it's been impacting mankind for the longest time since we've been flooded with social media and all of these things. And my point about this whole case today is I believe her healing is going to happen now. I believe her cancer is going to go in remission or at least she's going to get better and better and better. Because she walked out saying, I've never felt better in my life. Just releasing suppressed emotions can begin the healing of anyone. <clears throat> the point of today's video is, yes, it is true that boys and young girls, men and women are getting physically abused and sexually abused. Uh, just not in our country, probably all over the world. We don't know about it. And we can keep on talking about all these things. We can keep on, you know, launching protests against all these things. My whole point is that we need to create awareness that in our children, <clears throat> in people, if you've gone through this, yes, I know there will be fear. I know there will be humiliation. But you've got to find that one person 
or a group of people that you can confide in and at least speak it off, get it off your chest. The most important thing is communication. We all know that when we can't communicate in a relationship or between two people or between a boss and an employee, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up, it changes our behavior. We have bitterness, hatred, all the negative emotions. The human, human beings were meant to communicate. Since evolution, they were meant to communicate. But as we've evolved more and more, we're scared of being ridiculed. We're scared of seeming to be too weak. We're scared of being, you know, uh, of having shame and all of these things. So we decide to keep it inside of us. Now, that's a huge mistake. And it's not our fault. It's not that lady's fault. It's her own fears. And fears limit most of us every single day. And then my whole point about the connection of these suppressed emotions and disease. So fine, you got a cancer. Yes, I believe her cancer was caused because of suppressed emotions over the years. She believes it too. It doesn't matter who else thinks, speculates or believes what her cause of cancer was. She thinks it's that way. We've diagnosed it that way. Science can come in the middle. All of that bullshit can come in the center of it. But the truth is you have someone who believes that her emotions has destroyed her health and brought on her cancer. Now, fine, we got to be treating the emotions and we got to be treating the mind. Yes, the chemotherapy is going to help. Yes, her nutrition is going to help. My point is that when we blindly throw ourselves into all these quick fix medications and conventional treatments without addressing the root cause, which could be something like a suppressed emotion, that's why we don't see healing happening today. That's why we see more cancer, more diabetes, more heart problems and more deaths. It's not making anything better. Let's not just talk about medicine and the medical community. We'll talk about nutrition as well. So the patient comes to us and we're constantly working only on nutrition. Is the patient going to heal? Absolutely not because the root cause is emotions. So if we are working on nutrition and emotions and conventional treatment and lifestyle, the patient has the ability to prevent and the patient has the ability to heal. The point is there are so many people that we meet every single day who are suffering with childhood emotions, pent up suppression of emotions. And my only, my only plea to people is find someone that you can talk to about this. Yes, the law may be wrong. People may be wrong. Parents may not be raising their children the right way, their boys the right way. All of that. We know that at a superficial level. It's real. But the point is it's still happening. So while we're trying to fix that and while we're hoping that the country gets stricter with its laws and people start changing and people start, you know, being more respectful towards men and women and vice versa as well. The thing that we can do is encourage people to speak. Communication is so important. Your child should have so much of security and faith and belief in their relationship with their parents or someone in the family that if something happens, they can walk up and they can tell them exactly what happened. But today we're exposing our kids to most, you know, these movies and TV programs and music. I'm not against all of this stuff, but I'm saying when it is so much into their life, they learn to suppress their emotions. They think that everyone on the other side of the screen or the radio are just cool people who have no problems and are dealing with all their issues with drugs, alcohol, partying, dressing up and all of those things. So children don't come out of their shell to talk because they, they'll immediately think they're weak that I can't express. And the same thing with full grown adults. They believe if they go and say, hey, I have a problem. You know, I got sexually abused or my partner hits me or my boyfriend hits me. They just feel that there'll be so much of shame and humiliation because we have failed at creating an environment which allows people to be who they are and say what is hurting them. We have all failed as a community. It takes a community to do that which is why children in school don't come home and tell half their parents kids because they're always trying to be like the coolest kid. We're probably the coolest kid in, kid in school is the most depressed kid, the kid with the most issues at home and all of those things. So we got to give our children and the people around us that faith and that belief that no matter what happens, communicate, communicate. Now that's what we can do to people who have probably not yet been abused, but so many people out there who have already been abused, the beauty of communication and your next thing is who do we tell? It's not about just you telling someone. It's also about the listener listening to you. There are two very, very important techniques when it comes to creating a space where people can really pour out every single issue that they have. I'm not saying do it in your society circle. You're, you'll probably never even tell your closest friends in your society circle what's happening in you because everyone's just trying to be someone else in that circle. I'm talking about creating a relationship within your family or a true friend or someone else 
where you can, you, you, you can be compassionately heard. Now, it's so important that if someone is coming, if I'm coming to speak to someone about all my problems, there's only one thing I'm looking for. I'm not looking for advice. I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm not looking for empathy. I'm just hoping that the person will compassionately listen to me without offering any of that. I just want to pour out my heart, pour out every problem in a space of trust. And the healing begins then. Can we create that space? Or every time someone speaks to us, are we trying to correct? Are we trying to offer advice? Are we trying to fix? We're not wrong. We want to make that person feel better. It's human nature to try to fix, to try to, you know, give advice, to try to heal them, to try to do all these things. But sometimes all they need is compassionate listening. And that is the beauty. The solution that I thought I would put on today's video is the ability for every one of us to create a Sangha within our own families if it's not within our own families because some people don't have perfect families and it's okay if you don't have a perfect family but you can create a Sangha amongst two or three individuals that you completely trust and you can be yourself with. A Sangha for example if the Sangha is going to happen between you and me and a third person I start first we do this in a very quiet space Okay, you don't have to light a candle, you don't have to light incense, you can if you want. This is totally different. In a Sangha, what happens is there are three people, we sit in a circle. I start speaking from my heart about anything and everything that is troubling me, that is weighing down on me. It could be the worst thing. And these two people in this space have no idea about anything. They are only listening. They are not even making eye contact with me, offering empathy, sympathy, agreeing, nothing like that. I may cry, I may get angry, I may shout. They don't even hold my hand. They are just doing a job of compassionately hearing and listening. Once I finish, the second person in the group starts. And then the third person starts. Now what's going to happen in the Sangha after I have emptied out all my problems and it's human nature for us to think that our problems are the worst problems in the world. When I start hearing the person on the side and I say, oh my God, my problems may not be as bad as that. We allowed compassion, the seed of compassion to grow within that group that I'm not suffering alone. Someone else is suffering as well. And let me tell you one thing. Every human being is suffering at some point in their life. Every single human being. And there's nothing wrong with it. It is what life is. There is suffering. There are happy times. We just have to learn how to mediate between both these phases in our life. And then the third person starts talking in the Sangha. By now, we've heard three sides. No one's offering empathy, sympathy, nothing. You can't leave the Sangha and then go home and call and say, oh, I didn't know you were suffering so much, Luke. Here's a psychologist number. Here's a nutrition number. Go and see him. No, nothing. The beauty is compassionate listening to everyone. Compassion stems from there. And then that person gets stronger and stronger. You keep doing the Sangha. But the more it comes out of you, the faster you begin to heal, the more you realize that I'm not alone in what, whatever's happening. And you start forming these little groups and communities which are not based on giving advice, fixing problems or anything. Just listening and hearing. That is what a true Sangha is all about. It is one of the most healing circles that you can ever create. You can create it between husband and wife. You can create it between partners. You can create it with someone you don't know at all. But the beauty is Try to create these little Sangha spaces in your life because there are just too many people out there who are going through abuse and going through all of these things and they need that safe space to speak. Here's a little exercise for all of you who are in relationships or not. You know, really ask yourself, how true is your communication with your partner? Will you be able to tell your partner every single thing that you're going through? And it's not because you want to hide. Many people, they don't want to stress out their partner because their partner's nature is such that if they tell them something, they'll get more anxious and more sick. But these are our assumptions and our illusions. And fine, you may not be able to do that. Every partner that you're with doesn't mean they have to be your counselors and your healers at the same point. You may find that out in your friend circle. You may find that out with strangers. You may find it out in a group that you're in. But you can form this little Sangha and have everything from your heart come out. Because once you start, it's like a chain reaction. More and more things will come out of you completely. Because we're constantly suppressing these things down. So we don't know how much it's hurting us. Suppressed emotions are real, people. They are impacting your immunity. They are impacting every one of the trillion cells in your body, which is why when you're emotional, negative, when you're negatively emotional, you feel your body trying to, you know, cringe in. But when you're happy and ecstatic, your body opens up, your posture changes, everything changes. For that change to happen, trillions of cells in your body are vibrating with the right frequency or the wrong frequency that your thoughts and emotions are creating for you. You know, I've never thought about it. After this case, 
you know, I got into a call with my mom and I was just talking about her. I never really asked her how bad her childhood was or what life she had. And I got to know that her, her father walked out of her life at a very young age. And, you know, so many things that we just take for granted in our parents that they've sacrificed and they've just done what they do. And I can't imagine the amount of pent up emotions my mom has been living with all her years. So sometimes you can find that sangha with your parents, maybe. You know, sometimes you've got to look around us and family time is not just about going out and eating and having ice creams and pizzas and all of that crap. Sometimes it's about engaging and bonding and really, I mean, how many of us really know the kind of life that our parents went through, their childhoods? And you know, you learn so much more and I just realized that my mom went through all of that an entire lifetime without complaining, without making, you know, making a big fuss of it or impacting our life. She held on to it with her strength. That immediately gives me strength to understand that some of the problems that I make into big issues in my life are nothing compared to what she's gone through. I learned compassion and I learned that everyone's suffering and we all have a choice to make that change right now. Yes, I understand for someone who's been physically or sexually abused, maybe I don't understand because it's not happened to me. But yes, I can understand from every patient that I meet every day who goes through these things that suppressing these emotions are only going to hurt us more and more and more. And it will bring out anger and bitterness and all of these things. These things are real no matter what anyone tells you. If you have the wrong emotions, it is harming your body. It is changing your behavior. If your behavior is changing, it is changing the outcome of what you expect from life. So I think it's extremely important for people out there to look for that one person or two people or create a Sangha space in your life where you can run and you can share compassionately. It's not going to happen in a bar with alcohol. It's not going to happen in a circle with you passing a joint around. It's not going to happen when half your friends are on drugs. That's all superficial. That's a bigger problem by itself. More people suppressing more emotions, filling more voids. I have nothing against alcohol. If you're doing it to relax and feel good, but if you're doing it to fill a void, it's only going to hurt you sooner or later. So the point is, even with our children, we got to create so much of space with them. Because today, look at children, they're constantly addicted to gadgets, they're constantly addicted to all of these things. It's our fault. We've got to create that space for them where they can really start relying on human bonding. And we can't just give up if they don't bond the first time. Do it the second, do it the third, do it the fourth time. Because you're competing with technology. You're competing with a video game that is constantly keeping their dopamine levels stimulated. Which we can't do in a human bonding, but that doesn't mean we give up. We constantly got to reverse all these things because no matter how fancy the world seems outside with technology and media and all the crap that we see and we're made to believe, it's a sadder and a more depressed place. It's a more depressed and sadder place. It's as simple as that. And the only change that we can make is from ourselves. We start one by one trying to change the way we communicate. Say something if it's on your heart. What's the worst that can happen is what you have to ask yourself. Even I have those things. I want to share certain things and I keep asking myself, what's the worst that will happen? It's our own fears. But when we can find that space to communicate everything, that is freedom. Freedom is not just being in a free country where the British don't rule us anymore and we have more problems and we have more rapes and we have more abuse. That's freedom. That's superficial freedom. The only person who can make you free is yourself from your thoughts, from your fears, from everything that is limiting us and constantly putting us down. We're not living free when we're living fake lives to be someone just to be accepted in society, you know, dressing a particular way because we have to. That's not freedom. You're controlled. You're imprisoned by society. That is in no way freedom. True freedom is when you're able to express what you want in a safe that is space that will not hurt you, but will allow you to evolve spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, and intellectually. So please, people out there, if you're going through abuse, whoever's going through abuse, the first part of your healing would be find that person or that group where you can really, really communicate, get it out of you. That's the first step. It may still not take away the pain that you've gone through, but it is the step. It is the first step towards your healing and towards your growth. Have a great day, everyone. Until next time, eat smart, move more, sleep right, and breathe deep. I have one more point, which is why your emotions it is so important while you're eating. While you're eating, if you're emotional and you're angry and you know, you're creating the space for your kids, always you know, hounding them to eat and they're angrily eating, it's useless. None of the food's going to be assimilated or absorbed. You've got to be in the right neurological system in the body to absorb and assimilate food. Your kid's not eating, take the food away. It's as simple as that. Get back to discipline. Get back to reinforcing these things. That's how you correct you know, little things in your family and that will correct the community and society and eventually, hopefully, the nation and the world. It all starts with what we do. 
You know, there's no point making people eat when they're stressed out and they're angry and we're hounding them to eat food just for the sake of, okay, I fed my child food. Tick box. Done. It's useless. They're better off not eating at that particular point. Because every emotion impacts the way we're digesting food, we're assimilating food, we're absorbing food. So this lady, this lady, I believe she will heal because it's out of her system. Her family will now take over and create that sangha and get it out of her system completely. She's already eating well. She's meditating. She's doing everything right. I believe her cancer and I hope her cancer will slowly get better for her. And there are so many people suffering with diseases from migraines to hair fall to whatever. You've got to look inside yourself and see the kind of emotions you're carrying. First, cut that out. Every other medicine, I'm not against medicines. It is only suppressing your symptom. Start understanding and addressing the root cause and we can have the dream of having a healthier life. Have a great day, everyone.